Thank you very much. Okay, so we are going to talk about all the endovascular interventions, all the stents, all the balloons, and we're going to do this in 15 minutes. Okay, so let's see uh, how we can go through this. So nothing to disclose, but I am going to give you a lot of information on some of the different uh, um, uh, vendors and companies that, uh, are, you know, what stents they have, what balloons they have, some of their registry data also. <coughs> but a lot of it's going to be institutionalized, right? You're, what you do at your institution, what your attendings do, will kind of help guide you uh, in the future here. So some of the advantages of endovascular therapy, local anesthesia, there's no incisions. Oftentimes these patients go home the same day after lying flat for four to six hours. They've got a short-term recovery, uh, no incisions uh, that they have to recover from, no swelling in the leg after uh, um, a bypass from all of your lymphatic dissection, et cetera. Um, this is back, this is a little bit old, this is from 2006, but it talks about the durability of endovascular procedures. And basically what it's showing you is that the more proximal you are, the better outcomes you're going to have with your patency over one to five years. And in general, stenting has better patency than balloon angioplasty. When to treat claudicants, you always want to try conservative management first. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, however, if that's failed or if they are se uh, severely disabled, if it's uh, completely disabled their quality of life, this would be an indication to treat. Critical limb ischemia, a patient with rest pain, ulcerations, or gangrene, you need to make sure you have inline flow um, and, and to improve their uh, functionality. And then acute limb ischemia, obviously that's a vascular emergency and you want to try to salvage that limb uh, if possible. The general approach to claudication is conservative management first, aspirin, statin, possibly uh, pletol, um, exercise, smoking cessation, uh, as you guys all know. Claudicants usually have less disease than those with critical limb ischemic uh, 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 disease in general. The thought process is that um, a claudicant will have single uh, uh, level and that a critical limb ischemic patient would most likely have a multi-level disease down the leg. Um, if you have that type of treatment or, or that type of disease, then you treat the proximal lesions first. Oftentimes a common femoral endarterectomy or an iliac angioplasty and stenting is going to resolve your symptoms. You don't have to keep on uh, uh, going down the leg to treat every small uh, stenosis or occlusion. Balloon expandable stents are usually performed on a proximal iliacs due to the radial force as well as the ability to uh, exactly uh, uh, nail where you want to put uh, the stent. You can put a balloon expandable or self-expandable stent in the external iliacs uh, as well as in the infraingual as necessary. Common femoral profunda revascularization with an endarterectomy, profundoplasty often is uh, sufficient for distal disease and that's still a great operation so that's something that you don't want to uh, lose. And for claudigans, obviously, the goal is to resolve symptom, but not to convert to a critically limb ischemic patient. Rarely do you need to do tibial interventions in this position. Tibial interventions are going to be for critical limb ischemic patients, and so far we have balloon angioplasty and or atherectomy. Um, there are bailout stentings. You can put a coronary stent if you had a bad dissection within that, but again, that's not anything that we uh, recommend. Um, and it's limited durability, as you can see. As tibial disease, you can continue to treat your primary and your secondary patency as the months go on. It's going to come back and you're probably going to have to re-intervene. So your case planning, uh, pre-procedural evaluation, history and physical exam, you always want to make sure that you have common femoral uh, uh, pulses. If you don't have common femoral pulses, then you would like to consider uh, performing a CTA to confirm what your more proximal disease is. Also, uh, duplex, Doppler and duplex, as we just uh, discussed. Whether you go antegrade or if you go from the contralateral uh, access, antegrade access is preferred oftentimes for people with distal disease. It allows you for more pushability because you can place your sheath more distally and you avoid, uh, you could avoid a hostile uh, bifurcation if it's very narrow, if they have an EVAR, et cetera. Um, and oftentimes you can stay in a smaller sheath size. Retrograde from a contralateral access is the most common as it gets you away from the radiation, it gets you away from your II, um, it, but you need a full support of a longer sheath. So instead of using, for example, a six French 45 centimeter sheath, you're going to ask for a 65 or a 75 so that you can actually push it down into that SFA if you're, if you're treating uh, more distally. Um, you can perform brachial access. This is a feasible option, but again, you're, you have to think about your lengths that you have to uh, provide, and your balloons will only come in certain lengths as well as your stunts. Crossing a lesion. This is where every institution is going to be different. There's all kinds of different sheaths, support catheters, and wires. This is just a selective few. 
If you're doing the femoral popliteal system, you usually can do this through an 035 uh, catheter and wire-based system, whether that's an angle glide wire, angle glide catheter, CXI catheter, quick cross catheter, et cetera. And then your 018 and your 014, there's a whole wide range of it. Most of your attendings will use each wire for different reasons. They'll give you their reasons. Uh, talk to your vendors. They'll tell you a little bit of why they would recommend certain wires too. They're very, very helpful with all of this. But again, this is stuff you will learn as you continue to do cases. This is not something you just need to memorize right now. There's also, for complete occlusions, there's different devices. Oftentimes, you have to try to either stay within the true lumen, if you actually have one, or you're going to get into a subintimal plane. How you get back into the true lumen, there's multiple devices. So this top, on this top, uh, top right of the screen, that's the crosser device. This actually is to try to stay within the middle of the plaque and kind of push through, and, and it burrows uh, slowly through until uh, you can get a wire across. Um, the one closest to the writing is the outback. This again, you're in a subintimal plane, you push a needle out uh, uh, through the plaque to try to get back into the true lumen, followed by a wire. Um, once you have a wire in place, you can then perform your intervention. And then the uh, anterior reentry system, this is, has a balloon on it where it actually pushes against the wall and the plaque so you, have, you know which way you have to direction, uh, place your wire to uh, direction back into the uh, true lumen. Again, there's multiple ways to do this. Everybody's going to be different, but once you have a wire across, you get your catheter across, you reconfirm with an angio that you're in the true lumen, and then you can place over a stiffer wire if necessary and then perform your intervention. Um, we're going to skip that. Retrograde pedal approach, this is a feasible and safe option. It's an option oftentimes for high-risk patients that have failed anterograde uh, recannulization. Um, this is something that uh, is being used more and more. Uh, if you have a flush SFA or tibial occlusion, this may be an option for use in retrograde approach. Distal popliteal occlusions extending into the origin of the tibial vessels, failed anti-grade recannulization, or, and those that are high risk for a surgical bypass. There's a little bit uh, of theory that people think that based on how the, how the plaque forms too, it, whether it's a concave or convex lesion, Oftentimes when you're in an anti-grade approach, you're thinking that this is more of this convex lesion and it's pushing your wire into that subintimal plane. Oftentimes you have a softer plaque in the more distal uh, um, portion of that lesion and through a retrograde approach, you'd be surprised on how rapidly your wire will access across this and you can actually try to perform an intervention. So an example, a 93-year-old woman with toe green gangrene. If you have a lesion on the foot, that means you have to get inline flow. Doing just a balloon angioplasty of the SFA or the popliteal, if you have no inline flow through your tibials, is not going to heal anything. It's just going to lead to an amputation. So you're going to give this the best shot you can. So for example, uh, you know, in this patient, you can see that there's a popliteal lesion, but then as you go distally, you can see the anterior tibials open as well as the DP. So coming from a retrograde access, you, uh, uh, you can get a wire from distally and then your catheter is down as far antegrade as possible. So wire coming from below, getting across the lesion, and then there's a technique called the safari technique. This is where you're going to match your catheter from above and your wire from below, and you're actually going to cannulate into that catheter. Once your wire's in that system, you can then push your catheter through, and then once you get across the lesion, you know you're in the true lumen. Again, shoot your angio, and then from the antegrade catheter, you can place your wire back through. Again, you know you're in the true lumen, and you can intervene. Balloon angioplasty is performed, and you have a resolution of that uh, complete occlusion, and now you have the patient with inline flow. Endovascular treatment options um, of actually intervening. You have angioplasty. Uh, whether that's with a uh, just plain old balloon angioplasty or a drug-eluting balloon. Um, you can do subintimal, cutting balloons, cryoplasty. Uh, stenting, there's balloon expandable, self-expandable stents, as well as your drug-eluting stents. You have covered and uncovered stents um, that are uh, usually self-expandable. And then you also have atherectomy. So you have a lot of options, and we're just going to talk about a few of them and uh, some of the literature on it. But again, this is going to be institutional, uh, um, you know, driven on, on how you often treat. But I'll give you 
kind of a, a overlay. So plano balloon angioplasty, the patency for favorable lesions in the fempop uh, segments range anywhere from 50 to 70% at one year. Claudicans after balloon angioplasty have a three-year patency of 61% for stenosis, 48% for occlusions. Subintimal angioplasty can be utilized for complete occlusions uh, um, to improve flow. And one of the good things with the balloon angioplasty, you have a wide variety of lengths that you can perform pretty much all the way to 250 uh, um, uh, uh, millimeters, actually, I shouldn't say centimeters. Um, Stenting, so you can have self-expandable and balloon-expandable stents. Self-expandable stents deploy um, through a, uh, from a delivery system. Um, oftentimes they come in, in many lengths uh, so that you can perform a multitude of them uh, um, for the entire uh, femoral popliteal system, uh, typically used in infrainguinal locations. Balloon expandable stents, these are mounted actually to a balloon. They're usually in a f uh, used in fixed locations that need a high radial strength. So that's one of the reasons why we oftentimes use this in the iliac system. And this allows for a very precise deployment. Oftentimes, some of the self-expandable stents, they'll jump on you, but we are getting better uh, deployment options um, as time has progressed. So this is just an example of a complete occlusion of an iliac where we're able to get a wire across and a balloon expandable stent that's placed just below the aortic bifurcation. So this is gonna allow you, if you need to do further interventions, you can still come up and over that, a that aortic bifurcation. Here's a, um, a balloon angioplasty and stenting again of an occlusion. You can see all of the uh, collaterals that are initially filling because of the severity of the lesion. You perform your angioplasty, you stent post balloon dilatation, and now you're not seeing any filling of any of that collaterals. Atherectomy, um, at the institution that I trained, we don't really do atherectomy very much. So um, again, everybody's gonna be a little bit different. The technique is to remove the plaque from the peripheral arteries, whether this is excisional, rotational, or laser. To date, the only proven use of atherectomy is laser atherectomy for instant stenosis. Excisional atherectomy, this is if you have a really big bulky plaque and if you're going to stent this, the thought is that you're going to continue to have this, this force on your stent that's going to slightly crush it. It's going to continue to have uh, stenosis in this location. If you debulk it first, followed by either just balloon angioplasty or stenting, you can get an improvement uh, in your uh, imaging. Problem is, is what if you're in the subintimal plane and you do an, uh, an atherectomy or if you're on the wrong side? You can take more than you bargain for, okay? So you need to be very, very careful when you're doing this that you know you're in, um, you're actually within the true lumen and you're bulking the plaque, debulking the plaque and not taking away the intima. Rotational atherectomy, another device uh, um, that's gonna try to core out, again, a lesion. These are just microparticles that are gonna be shooting distally. If you can get a wire, if your wire is across and you can put a, um, a, a, a basket, uh, you know, to, to catch anything, uh, you know, that's, that's great, uh, but they, uh, it's not uh, mandatory. But you do have to be careful if you have only single vessel runoff that your, your chance of, um, and uh, embolism distally uh, of a piece of that plaque is definitely a possibility. This is just a bunch of the studies that have been performed, uh, uh, reports about atherectomy. Again, they do show that their primary patency or in their TLR is, is, uh, has showed successful results. But again, as stated, there's no randomized controlled trials that have, have demonstrated this. So, uh, you know, take it for what it's, what it's worth. Peripheral endografts, uh, these are for covered stents, for example, like a Viabon. The advantage of this is that they're heparin coated. They have a heparin bioactive surface. Um, they also have this contoured end at their proximal uh, uh, location that potentially improves their flow dynamics. Um, the thought with these, though, you also have to think about is that you're putting a covered stent, which means those collaterals that were there are now going to be covered. So if that stent goes down, you no longer have that collateral system in there. When these things are open and their patency rates, they're great. They, they do have a, a, a strong patency rates. But when they do, do go down, um, you need to be aware that you're not going to have that collateral system that still fills. Uh, here's just an example of a long uh, segment occlusion of the SFA that was able to be crossed. Uh, balloon angioplasty coverage stent is placed, and you've got a successful outcome um, with your uh, distal runoff. So now we're in this era of drug-coated balloons and drug-eluting stents. Drug-coated balloons, this is the 
Levant 2 trial, this is Lutonix uh, data that just showed at balloon angioplasty versus uh, their uh, um, drug-coated balloon. And then if they did not get an adequate balloon angioplasty, they did place a provisional stent. What they saw at one year was approximately a 20% improvement in patency rates. The impact SFA trial, this one actually went out to three years, and it pretty much shows the same thing. You have about a 20% improvement um, in your patency rates as you uh, progress forward. They also looked at their clinically driven uh, uh, target lesion uh, revascularization um, and saw uh, a statistically significant um, difference with uh, drug-coated uh, balloons compared to uh, balloon angioplasty. This was just uh, uh, recently uh, um, uh, presented. This is the below the knee uh, DCB that's about to come out. Um, the Lutonix is going to have some two and three millimeter balloons that are coming out. Um, this is just from their registry and at six months their freedom from um, all-cause death, amputation, thrombosis, etc. and reintervention was quite good and at their 12 month their freedom from any type of reintervention, major amputation or distal embolization was uh, uh, quite improved and we'll see what their overall patency rates uh, are in the future. Five-year data on the Zilver PTX, 479 patients were randomized. Uh, these were lesions less than six centimeters in length. Um, primary patency and provisional patency were looked at after balloon angioplasty. Again, you saw a dramatic difference with the drug-eluting balloons compared to balloon angioplasty or balloon angioplasty with bare metal stent. So then the question arises, what should you use? Drug-coated balloon, drug-eluting stent. There's not a lot of data. Just about six months ago at Link, this was uh, the first randomized controlled trial looking at the difference between these two. You did see an improvement um, in your stent patency. However, there was no statistically significant difference uh, when they looked at balloon uh, angioplasty with a drug-coated balloon and stenting compared to drug-coated balloon alone and Zilver PTX. Again, one, three and f uh, or one two, and three-year uh, patency rates. Obviously, they go down as time progresses. Um, but they did not demonstrate, again, any statistically significant difference between the three. Um, again, this is just short. This is the first study that was uh, looking at this. These are Kaplan-Meier curves. We'll see what this eventually ends up showing. There's a lot of current technologies. There's a lot of stents. There's a lot of balloons that can be used. All of your institutions will probably have different ones. You're going to have to go through the shelves. You're going to have to learn your balloons and your stents and talk with your attendings on um, how lesions are oftentimes going to be treated. There's this uh, forest trial, which also is a new, one of the newer randomized uh, comparisons for femoral popliteal uh, drug-eluting balloons from stents. So we'll see how that progresses. Insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to feel that way very often with peripheral interventions, but you're going to continue to try to salvage limbs, so keep it up. In summary, there's num uh, numerous endovascular treatments that are available. Uh, you need to uh, look at your indications, location of the disease, expected durability, and the cost when making all of these selections, whether you're, you're going to continue to perform this, offer an open intervention, or potentially even an amputation. Thank you.